Hello, welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. This is program number 28 in our series on the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at chapter 17. There's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so we're moving along. After this, we won't have that many to go. But we're looking at a story about the great prostitute and the beast. That is the story of this entire chapter 17. We have seen this already before. This is going to be another stating of that which has been stated before, but there's a few added details. It's quite a dramatic story, and here we encounter this, the woman, the woman. And it is a, an incredible picture, and I'd love to see how, if this could ever be staged, I don't know, um, filmed, I don't know. Uh, it, would, it would be almost impossible, I think, to do this. I don't know if John Houston's depiction of the Bible went into this sort of thing uh, back in the 60s, but if he did, it probably didn't come out so good because I don't know how you could really do justice by the imagery that we have here. So here we go. The great prostitute and the beast. Now, remember, what we have, we have the trinity of the demonic. We have the dragon, who was Satan. We have the first beast, the beast out of the sea, who is the Antichrist. Then we have the second beast, the one out of the earth, who is what's called the false prophet. We haven't run into that terminology yet, but we will. So we have the dragon, uh, the Antichrist, uh, the false prophet. This is the parody or the counterfeit of the Holy Trinity. So we see that. Now we're going to encounter something a little bit new called Babylon or the great prostitute. An interesting concept. Here we go. Chapter 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me. Now, remember the bowls we talked about in chapter 16, these bowls being poured out. Now, the book of Revelation is built around the scroll with the seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. Now, the bowls have been poured out. The reminder, looking back, it says, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who was seated on, the many water, seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of those, of wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have become drunk. Wow. Uh, I have to be careful here not to get caught up um, with, this, uh, with these two verses here. But it's quite a story. We, the bowls have been poured out. Now is a look into the actual judgment. Here we see Satan and the demonic kingdom experiencing judgment now. And he says, come, I'm going to show you. And it's reference to the great prostitute seated on many waters. Many waters is the idea of all of the earth. The, this great prostitute who has essentially ruled and overwhelmed and overcome all of the world. That's why some will suggest maybe the great prostitute is really a worldview. And I have a tendency more to look at it that way than, let's say, a single, let's say, government of, let's say, communism or anarchy or socialism or fascism or democracy or whatever you want to think of. <coughs> more than that, more than a, a, a single religion or faith, but it's, it's, it's much more than, and larger than that because it is global. It encompasses all that there is, the many waters, the nations, languages, tribes, and people of the world. So it, it is worldwide. It may be a philosophy. Sometimes 
when I think about this, I, I think it's, it's maybe a philosophy, uh, or maybe it's, it's, a, it's a conglomeration of philosophies that are somehow uh, political, theological, all combined, um, or multiples thereof. Not any single, maybe not even a blending. But all of them have a similar characteristic in that it is favorable to a rejection of God. It is the adoption of a worldview that is antithetical to God. And I, I'm, as, I, as I work through Revelation again, I'm beginning to think that. I move way away from trying to identify um, nations and religions and individuals and philosophies. It, it's, it's, it's too large. That's, that's not big enough. But this is large, seated on many waters. And the kings of the earth, the leaders, the power brokers, they've committed sexual immorality, spiritually in that sense, in the sense of spiritual, that they have gone after other gods. They have chased that which is not God and trying to exploit and retain. And with the wine of whose sexual immorality, you see the images, you know, John was aware, you drink a lot of wine, you're going to get drunk. The wine and the sexual immorality is like a wine that overcomes. But the sexual immorality is not just that. Much larger sexual immorality is a symbol for much more imbibing on that which is, belongs to the world and to the demonic kingdom. The dwellers on earth have become drunk. Uh, the scripture said, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, so we find this imagery, it's already in the New Testament, it's been there for a generation from Paul's time. And before that, Old Testament references, plenty of them here. They have become drunk. You don't see properly. You don't hear properly. You don't walk properly. You've been taken over to one degree or another. And this is the picture, the idea of the drunkenness as the experience of knowing, knowing no better than just to follow the great prostitute. Verse 3, and he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. A wilderness, remember that's where Jesus dealt with Satan, the temptation of the wilderness. The wilderness was the place where, where Satan dwelt, where there was dry, there was no water, there was no life. But that's where Satan dwelt. So he takes him away into a wilderness and I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast. That woman is the great prostitute. We're going to find the woman is Babylon. Babylon. Uh, uh, let me mention something about Babylon. There's two Babylons. Uh, the first we find in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, where the Tower of Babel, B-A-B-E-L, was built. That On that site was the first city called Babylon. Now, the Babylon that this is actually referring to, in addition, uh, is would be called a Neo-Babylon, or the New Babylon. Uh, this was in modern day, uh, would be in modern day Iraq. Now apparently there's no real city of Babylon anymore. There's Baghdad and other cities, but no Bag Babylon. I don't think there's a city that's actually named Babylon anymore. But in, it was a powerhouse. It was a powerhouse in the 6th century B.C. Um, and the, what happened was, uh, the king of Babylon, you've heard of the word Nebuchadnezzar, uh, destroyed not only the city of Jerusalem, but the temple as well burnt it in 586 B.C., burnt the city. And it was from Babylon. That was the end of Israel. The, the ten, ten northern tribes had already been taken over by Assyria. Now the southern kingdom, all that was left, they called it Judah. 
or the house of Israel, or just Israel, the two tribes, uh, the, uh, the tribe of Judah and um, Benjamin, where Jerusalem is located, where the temple was, and they destroyed that, and they took the captives away. Took, they just pillaged the place, and they took away um, the articles of the temple, and probably uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments as well. Gone. And then it's so interesting, the story in the book of Daniel, that Daniel was one of the captives taken from Jerusalem to Babylon and as a, as a young boy. And he lived there, and they were just a wild. Babylon was just awful, terrible. And there was a time when uh, they were having a big feast, Belshazzar, and there was a big feast. And so there was words written on the wall, uh, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. And the king of Babylon didn't know what it meant. So he called Daniel, and Daniel said, the words mean, um, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And this was in 539 B.C. And there was a big party, and everybody was drunk. And the Medes and the Persians, Medes and the Persians, that would have been from Iran and a part of the west, uh, eastern part of Saudi Arabia, had joined together in a conglomerate, and they came in and they destroyed Babylon, wiped Babylon out. And Babylon was also known as the eastern boundary beyond which was evil, the Euphrates. And, and so there was... In the people's minds, Babylon represented a great deal when it came to biblical history. So, I saw a woman, this is Babylon, represents Babylon. This kingdom that was set against the people of God, sitting on a scarlet beast. Now here's the beast, the Antichrist, full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads, which is indication that it has the power of Satan, and ten horns, that it is powerful. Seven heads would, I'm sorry, means wisdom, very wise, brilliant. Ten horns, power, great power. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, royal colors, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Magnificent to behold, spectacular, stunning, captivating, with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Now, the abominations, we're thinking of Deuteronomy chapter 18, where there is a list of the abominations, magic, fortune-telling, necromancy, the channeling, all of those strange occult arts. Those are referred to as abominations, but also the word abominations in the Old Testament is also used for the sin of homosexuality. So you've got homosexuality, weird sexuality, you've got uh, the occult arts that are being practiced. That is the connotation of Abominations along with the third category, and that is idolatry. A golden cup. Oh, I've got a great quote here from you, from one of my favorite commentators. Um, hope I can find it. From William, uh, William uh, 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 Hendrickson. He says, Revelation 17 is a lesson for every day. It reveals the course of worldly individuals. First, they become infatuated with the pleasures and treasures of the world and harden themselves against God. When it is too late, they experience a revulsion of feelings. They are punished by the results of their own foolishness. So <clears throat> this, is, this is an interesting story that we're looking at. So... Uh, and then it says in verse 5, And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, 
mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. So here we have Babylon reborn, the second coming of Babylon. But now it's seated on many waters. It is incredibly beautiful and powerful. Um, there's also a quote I wanted to find on the cup. Uh, the cup, and I don't think I can find it. Oh, well. The cup of abominations in Jeremiah. Uh, here it is. It's on there. Babylon, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunk. The nations drank of her wine, therefore the nations went mad. Jeremiah 51, 7. Already Jeremiah, who was the prophet, who warned Judah, King Zedekiah, that Babylon was coming. He's the very one who did it. And here are the cup of the Lord, this gorgeous cup, but inside it was that which made you drunk and made you incapable of discernment and understanding what was right. the mother of prostitutes and the earth's abominations. Wow. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Bloodlust. Bloodlust. Um, the blood of the saints. Back in 1981, I wrote a book called Recollections of a Warrior, told to me by a friend who had come back from Vietnam um, he was a ranger, alert, long-range reconnaissance patrol, and he did a lot of pacifying of villages, and it was a horrid thing. Um, taking the chief, staking him down, alive, cutting out his heart, eating the heart. And they, it was a great stimulant. It was the warrior. That's what warrior means. I named the book Recollections, Recollections of a Warrior. And it, it, it's something that is understood in, in days gone by. It was understood uh, when you talk about the warrior, uh, that the warrior lived to kill. And we know that uh, the scripture says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning, a murderer from the beginning. In Acts, uh, excuse me, in John chapter 8, uh, I lost my place a little bit, but I want to read this to you. It's so significant. Here's what the scripture says. Jesus said about Satan, He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. A liar and a murderer from the beginning. So this is what we see. Satan is always going to work that in those people he controls. And we're going to see a little bit more about this in just a little bit. But the whole idea of being drunk on it. You know, Rome was the epitome of, of, uh, of that kind of lustful entertainment. Uh, last night, I saw Russell Crowe, one of my favorite films, The Gladiator. And that the... Uh, this was to entertain the masses in Rome. It was uh, pictured their power and their glory. The gladiatorial events where people were just slaughtered, where so many Christians uh, were placed there into, their, uh, into the arena to be killed by wild beasts. One of the stories I remember reading about how depraved Rome was, you won't read this all the time, how young girls were let loose in the arena and baboons were let loose to rape and kill them. And they were, and, and they, to be applauded, it was glorious. Everybody just cheered. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? After all, they're just slaves. They're enemies. And they don't mean anything to us. And so that's, that sort of thing is possible. Just murder for murder's sake. Just to kill and see the blood flow and the people scream and cry and weep and be in absolute terrible misery and kill them in the worst possible ways. That is what we're looking at here. Does that not happen today? It does. It, indeed, it does. Okay, I'm trying to find my place. Okay. 
When I saw her, I marveled greatly, verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So here is the Antichrist and the false prophet who carry the woman. The great demonic worldview. The beast you saw was and is not. Remember the <clears throat> that is a picture of the Antichrist who had the mortal wound, is now alive, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Now, notice how, how the Antichrist is pictured as and was. Jesus is I am. Satan and the dragon and all of it, they had a beginning and they have an end. Jesus is I am. He has no beginning. He has no end. It's quite an interesting contrast. And the dwellers of the earth whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world were marveled to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. They'd worship the beast. Now, now they have another picture of the beast altogether. And they're shocked. How could this be? What has become of it? They, they look and wow. They marvel. Because it had been so wonderful, so powerful. It had provided so much. It was the great delight, satisfied. But it came to an end. Verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Now, I could just imagine someone wondering, now what is Philpott going to say about this? Well, I don't have that much to say about it, because frankly, I don't understand much of it. What, I don't really own anything myself, but I'm going to give you a consensus of what commentators that I've come to rely upon over the years have said about this. That, John is writing about a known entity, about Rome itself. Rome, which was powerful up until 476 A.D., A.D. 476, and had its beginning uh, a thousand years before that. It was the greatest empire, probably that ever was. The symbol of worldly kingdoms opposing Christ and the woman. Remember the woman of Genesis 3.15, which is the church, you have the counterfeit woman, which is the great prostitute, but is Babylon. And, and so we have, we have this in, in, in the background. Uh, and so we, uh, we can't help but see that Rome is being pictured here. Now, the idea of the eighth, I have a little bit of an idea about the eighth. The eighth is like the fullness of evil. There is a, a fullness of evil that comes just before uh, Jesus returns and the day of judgment ensues. That's the best I've got on that. Okay, verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. I wish I knew how to interpret that, but I don't. Verse 13. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for his Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is talking about the battle of Armageddon again that we talked about, we saw in chapter 16, um, uh, verses uh, 15 and 16. This, once again, is picturing the very same thing. There are chapters right next to each other, 
but in John's writing this down or John's receiving the vision may have been separated by a long time. We can't be fooled by the proximity here. This is another way of picturing this. So there is the battle, but the lamb will conquer, the conquering champion of God. Conquer them. He is Lord of lords and kings of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. God calls. He calls us. You cannot come to God of your own. It's impossible. I've known some people who tried and tried. They don't know what to do. You have to be called and chosen. The word chosen is elect. There are three words here. Um, uh, kletoi, eklektoi, and pistoi. Called, elect, or chosen, and given life. Faith. So it's something, again, that only God gives. He calls, he chooses, he gives the faith. Verse 15. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Ha! A rebellion. A demonic rebellion here. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over the royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Interesting. There's going to be Satan against Satan. Remember the thing that Jesus said? If Satan stands against Satan, Satan fights against Satan, his kingdom will not stand. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the time when Jesus returns. There will be this massive civil war against the enemies of Christ and the church. They will now be so drunk with the wine of wrath that they'll be attacking each other. Interesting how that works, isn't it? Verse 18, And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Again, that's talking about Babylon. So, here's Babylon. Power, wealth, fame. The Academy of Wars. You look at that, and that's what you want. Power, wealth, and fame. It's sort of the picture of all that is crazy. I love the Academy of Wars, but there you get a picture in a, right in front of you on television. Our world, how it bows down and worships all that which has nothing to do with the Lord. That's the end of this program. So long.